welcome back. In this series, we're slowly building up a one-bit vacuum tube computer that is inspired pretty heavily by the Motorola MC14500. But we've made some pretty hefty changes. Uh, most notably, we made some big changes to the logic unit to turn it into an arithmetic logic unit. Uh, and so I've been dubbing it the UE14500 for, uh, for Usagi Electric. <laughs> um, but in the previous episode, we got quite a lot of the processor itself actually built. As a matter of fact, I would say we're over two thirds of the way there. Uh, there's just a small section along the bottom that we got to build up now. And so what I want to focus on today is building up some of that small section. Most importantly, I want to talk about clocks. Now, the processor itself is not going to generate the clock signal on board. That's going to be offloaded to the program control board, which is a whole future problem that we're going to have to deal with. But the clock signal that's coming in from the program control board is going to need to be conditioned in some ways to make it correctly work with the processor. So let's hop over to the bench. We'll take a look at what kind of conditioning that signal is going to need. Then we'll build it up on the breadboard and hopefully we'll build it up on some circuit boards and test it out. So let's get over there and get started. All right, so what we're looking at right here is the gate level representation of the entire processor. Uh, now there's a lot of things missing from here. Most notably, uh, there is no memory, uh, there is no program control, and there is no input output. This is just the processor portion of the computer. Now to break down what we're looking at uh, here, uh, on the far left here, we have our instruction register. This is a four bit register. Then we have our instruction decoder. Then along the top, we have our input enable register and our output enable register. Uh, then below that, we have our carry register, our result register. Um, and then this big collection of stuff here is the ALU. And in the bottom right, we have our skip register as well as some extra logic to suppress the F flag during skip operations. Now each one of these has to interact with the other in a very specific manner. Most importantly, we need to clock the instruction into the instruction register before we do anything else. So if you look closely at the top here, I've got CLK1 and CLK2 for the two clock signals that are going to be uh, necessary to make everything work here. And CLK1 clocks the instruction into the instruction register and CLK2 does the clocking for the uh, rest of the processor here. Now amidst all of these gates, uh, there is actually no conditioning for the clock signals. It's just two separate buttons. So we need to start thinking about how we're going to condition that clock signal to work for what we need here. Uh, so if we think about what's going to come in from our program control, we're just going to essentially get a square wave, which we can see here. Now we could use that directly. Uh, but the processor itself has a pretty heavy demand on the clock, so I'm going to want to buffer it. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to put a bunch of buffers on the clock that's coming in so that we have a nice strong signal that can supply a bunch of different logic gates within the computer. And if you remember, we had clock one and clock two. And clock two needs to happen after clock one because we want to clock in the instruction register first and then we can do the clocking for the arithmetic or whatever it is that we're doing after that. So this seems like it should be exactly what we need, but there's one more thing that we're forgetting, and that has to do with clock one. Clock one is only being used for the instruction register, which we can see over here on the left. And the way that I built the instruction register is just with some gated D flip-flops. So if we take a look at the design for the gated D flip-flops that I'm doing, uh, we can see here that there are uh, three different D flip-flop designs. Now the gated D flip-flop up here uses six NOR gates plus an inverter on the clock. And so what this means is that the clock needs to be high, and then when the clock goes low, it clocks in whatever data is on the data line here. And these are the D flip-flops that I'm using for the instruction register. And uh, six is a nice even number, but seven, this additional inverter here, is difficult. So the way that I built the D flip-flops was just as six NOR gates, and I said, I'll deal with the inverter later. Well, later has come. It's time to deal with that. Uh, so the way we're going to handle that is we're going to invert clock one. 
And so that means that we're going to end up with a waveform that looks somewhat like this. CLK1 is going to go from high to low, and then a certain amount of time after that, CLK2 is going to go from low to high. And then when CLK2 goes from high to low, CLK1 is going to go from low to high. Uh, so we, we end up looking like we almost have uh, this box being created that is just uh, slightly offset. Um, but I think this is the type of clock that's going to work best for us. So we need to think about how to build this up. Now, many moons ago, we built an operational amplifier to essentially use as a Schmidt trigger uh, because I thought that was going to be the best way to create a nice clock signal like this. Uh, but I had a big think about it and I realized that was just a massive amount of extra complexity that we did not need. So instead, I think what I'm going to do for the clock is I'm essentially just going to have uh, two separate amplifiers and I'm going to put an RC delay on one of them. Keep it as simple as possible. Now this schematic here uh, I built up, you can see it says using six DJ8 triodes. Uh, on the actual clock, I'm gonna use six AU6s. I just use six DJ8s here because it helps keep the schematic clean and simple and easier to understand. Uh, and it helps it simulate really well in Tina. Now what we have here is we just essentially have two separate amplifiers and on the right of both of these we have some uh, cathode follower buffers. Uh, but as far as the signal that the clock is going to be putting out, these cathode follower buffers don't affect it in any way. They just make it stronger. On the far left of the schematic, you can say it says CLK. This is our clock input coming from program control. And so looking at the top side here, it just goes into our standard inverting amplifier and uh, that's it. All it does is invert the clock signal that's coming in and then send that inverted clock signal through some buffers and send that out. This is the inverted clock signal that we need for CLK1. Now for CLK2, we need to delay it a little bit. So all I did was I threw an extra RC delay on the clock input that's coming in, uh, and then it goes into an inverting amplifier, uh, but that clock signal is backwards of what we need. So we take the output out of that, we run it into another inverting amplifier, this flips it back around to what we need, and it adds a certain amount of delay to it beyond what our CL1 is, then we buffer it and send it out as CLK2. And so there we go, that is a really simple way to build our clock. Now I can adjust the level of delay that CLK2 has beyond CLK1 by adjusting the value of this resistor or this capacitor. I can change the capacitor out for a larger capacitor or I can make this resistor larger and that can make the delay longer or I can make it smaller and make the delay less. Uh, so I think it's time that we give this a test on the breadboard. Now we don't need to build the uh, buffers on the breadboard because, well, the breadboard version is just going to be showing us some signals. Uh, so I think we're only going to really need three tubes to put onto the breadboard to test out. And I want to see what our delay here looks like. So let's go ahead and pull the breadboard out and let's give this a test. All right, here's our breadboard uh, with our three tubes on it that are going to make up our clocks. This is going to be clock one, and then these two together will be clock two. And that has our RC delay on it. Now we're going to need to power this up, so I've got my little power supply here uh, that we can plug in and get to power, uh, but I, I don't know the best way to see this delay because the delay is gonna be very, very short, and there's not a good visual way to see that, unless of course you have an oscilloscope. So I think we need to get the oscilloscope out. So uh, here we go, let's get the oscilloscope. Oh, oh, jeez. All right, this thing is uh, not lightweight, that's for sure. Uh, but we've got it hooked up. Uh, I've got input A hooked up to clock one, and I've got input B hooked up to clock two. And I've got a little button to push, uh, so that way when I push the button, they should flip states. So if I push the button, uh, I'm gonna be honest, I, I, I don't know what's going on here. Uh, there's a couple problems. <laughs> um, the trace is the same color, they're both green. Uh, so I, I don't know which trace is which, which one is high, which one is low. And also it's not a storage oscilloscope, so I can't uh, push the button and then you know move around and take a look at it. Uh, this thing is a pretty, pretty old oscilloscope, so we have to maybe think outside the box here. Um, and so this, well, if I can push the button fast enough, I can maybe start to get Oh yeah, all right, that's kind of interesting. Um, 
All right, so I need some way to push the button really, really fast. <laughs> And well, pushing a button really, really fast is really just the same thing as generating a square wave. Uh, so what I've got right here is a 6CG7. This is a dual triode. And I've set up the breadboard here so that it can be a, uh, a stable multi-vibrator. So we'll go ahead and plug that one in right quick. Now the waveform that's going to come out of the 6CG7 is not going to be a perfect logic low and a perfect logic high. Uh, so I've got another 6AU6 here, taking that waveform and uh, amplifying it, or you know, mostly just pushing it into a saturation and cutoff to give us a nice clean square wave. Now let's remove our uh, input A here from our clock one, and let's put it on here and see what that looks like on the scope. All right, we're getting somewhere. Uh, let's go ahead and just look at A only here, and we'll change the trigger to internal, uh, and then we will adjust our trigger level until we get it, um, and then, yeah, there we go. All right, so that is our clock signal. We can see that we've got a little bit of a funky edge here, uh, but that should be good enough. And so I'm just gonna hook that clock signal directly into the input for both clock one and clock two, and hopefully we can get a clean square wave coming out of those. All right, now what we're looking at here is the clock one signal. So it starts high, goes low for a set amount of time, comes back up to high, and well, that's a really clean looking square wave. Uh, let's take a look at uh, clock two and see what it looks like. Uh, yeah, and it looks like the polar opposite of clock one, uh, which is perfect. So let's look at both of them at the same time here. Uh, yeah, there we go. I mean, you can see that the uh, Position here is not quite perfect. If I line up the bottoms of both of them, they look like that. Uh, but we'll slide this one down a little bit so we can clearly see the difference between the two. Uh, but you can see that clock one starts high, drops low, and then a set amount of time after that, clock two goes from low to high. Uh, and then they both uh, return pretty much at around the same point. Uh, the delay here isn't nearly as big as I thought it would be. So that's really awesome. We have a uh, perfect delay here. Uh, and well, I can see that it looks like it's um, pretty much half of one of these boxes is how long the delay is. Uh, and right now a uh, box is a centimeter and we've got it set up to 0.5 milliseconds per centimeter. So we've got a 0.25 millisecond delay. Now on the breadboard here, I've got a 100,000 ohm potentiometer. Um, so I'm going to change the value of that potentiometer and see if that changes our delay up here any at all. Um, these things are really finicky to use on the breadboard, but yeah, there we go. Look at that. Oh man, I can take the delay down to, well, right there. That's pretty much no delay whatsoever. Uh, and then I can go the other direction and get a huge delay. <laughs> Uh, that's pretty much uh, a 0.5 millisecond delay right there. Uh, now clock two, the, <laughs> the, the clock two is getting really, really short. It's now just essentially a blip. Uh, and clock two has pretty much gone away there. That, <laughs> but that's awesome. Uh, now the clock speed that I'm using here is just whatever random speed the uh, 6CG7 is putting out in, uh, in reality, I'm not gonna be running a computer anywhere near this fast. Uh, so I can probably run a longer delay if I need to, but I like that I have the adjustability. I can choose whatever delay makes the computer work perfectly. This is awesome. That is so cool. Uh, well, now all that's left is to take this, cut out some PCBs, and uh, we'll see if the PCBs work. And here we go, here are the PCBs. And uh, well, they look awesome. Uh, I'm really pleased with the way they came out. They're a little more Spartan than the other PCBs that we usually build, uh, but that's because these are mostly uh, cathode followers. Um, but you can see here that uh, this is clock two because it has the uh, multi-turn potentiometer here. Uh, and I actually made a little socket for the uh, capacitor so I can hot swap to a different capacitor if I find that I have trouble with that capacitor value in the future. Now I want to plug these in and test them, uh, but there's a ton of connections that I need to get right. Uh, and it's going to be kind of a pain with them floating around. Uh, if only there was something that I could mount them to. All 
right, I've got everything uh, set up and well, the uh, waveforms that we see here are coming out of our PCBs here. So uh, everything seems to be working really well, which is awesome. Now, a couple notes about the setup. Uh, in order for this machine to properly detect alternating signals, so that means that I've got A and B coming in and uh, it draws them both on the screen, uh, they recommend that you use an external AC input, which is what this uh, extra wire here is. This is just hooked up to the uh, clock one output. So it's pulling its sync directly from clock, clock one, uh, which makes this line up a lot better. Now, the second thing to note is that I'm using the internal calibrator uh, to generate the square wave that is acting as our clock. Uh, and the internal calibrator is adjustable, so I've got it set to 20 volts uh, peak to peak. The only problem is, is that the uh, calibrator's uh, frequency cannot be adjusted. Um, so uh, right now I've got it set to 0.5 milliseconds per division. Um, and it looks like the frequency of the calibrator is sitting pretty much at one kilohertz, uh, which is way, way faster than I ever intend to drive this computer. Uh, at most, I'm hoping for like a hundred hertz, so one tenth of this. Uh, but this uh, gives us an idea of where the limitations of our clock can be. Uh, we can see that, uh, well, clock one looks to have a pretty lazy falling edge. Uh, now, that falling edge only appears to be lazy because we're at one kilohertz. I did not design this thing to move that fast. Uh, but even still, that's not bad. Uh, and we can see that the falling edge starts and once it gets to almost all the way down, then clock two bumps up with our rising edge. Uh, and I have my little screwdriver here and I can pop that right on top of the potentiometer here. And, and look at that, I can adjust the delay. How cool is that? <laughs> so I can choose whatever delay I want. That is awesome. Now I can also just uh, hot swap the capacitor. I can even remove it. So I've actually pulled the capacitor out right now. Uh, and you can see that clock two's rising edge and clock one's falling edge happen at pretty much the same time. Uh, but we can put that capacitor right back in and there we go. That's my delay. <laughs> an, an adjustable clock two. That is so cool. <laughs> that just looks awesome to me. Uh, but there we go. We have uh, our clock squared away for the computer. For now, I am just super happy that we have our clock squared away. It's not plugged into the rest of the machine yet because I have to build out the rest of the bottom piece here because there's a lot of things that are codependent down here. M man, it's getting so close. I'm so amped up and excited about this. I, I cannot tell you guys how excited I am. <laughs> Uh, but for now, I'm going to keep playing with this. I want to thank you guys so much for watching, and I hope to see you in the next episode.